Chapter 3, Incentivizing Investment, Roads Through the Turnpike Era. The third and last duty of the sovereign or commonwealth is that of erecting and maintaining those public institutions and those public works which, though they may be in the highest degree advantageous to a great society, are, however, of such a nature that the profit could never repay the expense to any individual or small number of individuals, in which it therefore cannot be expected that any individual or small number of individuals should erect or maintain. The performance of this duty requires, too, very different degrees of expense in the different periods of society. Adam Smith, in Inquiry into the Nature and Causes of the Wealth of Nations. 3.1. Steam Cars Nathan Reed, an early steamboat developer in Connecticut, proposed a steam-powered automobile in the 1790s. When his patent application was read aloud in the House of Representatives, members struggled to suppress laughter. Nevertheless, he received a patent. Reed's innovation was the multi-tubular boiler, which reduced the size of boilers by creating a large boiling surface in a small volume. He passed water through the boiler and tubes. All subsequent vehicular boilers put water in tubes through fire, or fire and tubes through water. He later served in Congress himself. Reed wasn't the only one who conceived of steam-powered cars. Charles Mahon, the third Earl of Stanhope, developed a steam-powered land carriage that had the amazing tendency to speed up hills, stall on level ground, and stop completely on downhill slopes. In 1805, Oliver Evans adapted a steam engine to an amphibious land water vehicle, the Oruktor Amphibolos, Greek for amphibious digger. Driving from Philadelphia's streets, starting at his works where the later the John Wanamaker department store would locate, into the Schuylkill River, down to the Delaware. Since this was both the first car and the first working steamboat on the Delaware since Fitch's Perseverance 15 years ago. Fitch also developed a prototype of the first self-propelled steam locomotive before he died, though the technology ultimately was brought to market by others. While the steam-powered automobile would wait nearly a century, the steam engine's application to rail was soon to come. Richard Trevithick developed and demonstrated a steam road carriage. Goldsworth Gurney, also developer of Limelight, developed a successful steam coach and a tow for coaches, a drag, in 1825. In 1831, in using a Gurney drag, Charles Dance offered coach services with a 75% reduction in coach fares, and Thomas Telford proposed widespread services using plateways, tracks consisting of flange strips that were used in some early railroads. Walter Hancock's steam van, the unfortunately named Autopsy, was offering service in the London area during the 1830s. Steam-powered road vehicles never received much of a trial. They were resisted by road providers who wanted to protect their facilities from heavy vehicles. The debate over who would get the transportation rents, the coach or wagon operators, or the road providers, must have played a part. Road policy, then as now, emphasized the protection of road surfaces using limits on weights, widths of wheels, etc. No doubt, too, providers of wagon and carriage services strive to protect their businesses from interlopers using new technology. It has even been suggested there was a conspiracy to block steam vehicles on roads on the part of the railroads and others. In spite of this resistance by road providers, someone might have found a niche and gotten the design right. But the clock ran out. The window for development was closed when markets were co-opted by rail service. That's one explanation for what happened. Less general explanations point to the low horsepower per unit of weight of then steam engines and the high rolling resistance of then road surfaces. Thus, unlike rails and rivers in the preceding two chapters, roads were not to be plied by steam-powered vehicles en masse. They were to remain the domain of human and animal-powered motion until the end of the 19th century, when the electric streetcar emerges. Three point two from trails to roads. The first networks that humans exploited were given by nature. For transportation, these include rivers and waterways, ocean and air currents, and even deer trails, mainly connecting deer bedding and feeding sites, but also trails to mating sites and escape for la on land. Despite evidence of roads elsewhere, we begin by touching on the development of Roman roads, a system built over a five hundred year period, with mileage about the same as that of the US interstate highway system. Except for bridges, Roman engineering seems not to have been emulated very much. Reverse engineering on the Roman roads tells us how they were built. They were stone structures made of polygon-shaped rock bound by mortar. The roads comprised long straight segments with stiffer grades than those allowed in later road building. Curvature was avoided except where necessary, mountain passes, natural places to ford or bridge rivers. 
Comparisons of Roman and modern road mileage between places find that the Roman roads were shorter than modern roads. It may have been that straight and sometimes steep roads allowed for rapid movement of marching troops. Wagons, which would have liked low grades, were not so common. Without front axles that turned, Roman wagons worked best on straight roads. The typical load seems not to have been more than 225 kilograms. Some evidence exists that the right of anyone to use a road dates from Roman times, as does the idea of the common carrier. A good part of Roman design was symbolic, a strong, powerful artifact ignoring terrain and pushing straight ahead. Roman roads equal Roman power. The decline of Roman power led to the slow decline of Roman roads as nature took its course. As new areas developed that had been unserved by Roman roads, new links were needed, and those were not built to the same standards, if the term built can be used at all. Roman roads accommodated carts, but by about 1600, the population in military and church institutions were mainly served by ways, trails, traces, or paths along which people could walk, ride on horses, or drive animals. Geoffrey Chaucer provided descriptions around 1380. Like the Roman roads, these routes had an as the crow flies character. There were paths and often had fairly steep grades, with route orientation tempered by the location of mountain passes and fords. While roads may seem an inconvenient form of transport, when compared with the rivers and coasts which allowed fluid movement, they had their advantages. Unlike rivers and canals, roads would not freeze for the winter season and unlike the coasts, were not severely affected by winds. This kept roads significant for inland markets that had alternative networks available. Three point three, the Corvée. The Corvée in England. England's long standing parish road system used, one hesitates to say, employed, statute labor. The Corvée system geared itself to local needs and relied on manorial organization. The system of statute labor seems foreign to the twenty first century, especially in the United States without a military draft. The idea is similar to taxation, except residents were taxed their time instead of their money. The difficulty is ensuring quality control. A dollar is a dollar, a pound is a pound, but an hour from a productive individual is very different than an hour from an unproductive one. The system began to be strained in the 16th century because of the growth of through traffic. Roads were no longer a local matter, and the breakdown of the manorial organization of life. This also introduces the free rider problem. Local residents have little incentive to maintain roads for non-local, through travelers. Moreover, the substitution of the Church of England for the Roman Catholic Church eliminated a major source of road maintenance monks aiding those on pilgrimages. The decline in quality of the roads led to revision of the early 16th century system. Bridges were a technical and fiscal problem, addressed by the 1537 Statute of Bridges. This was followed by the Highways Act of 1555, resulting in the election of surveyors to plan and supervise the four days of statute labor per year, which was soon raised to six days. With revisions, this system served until the 1830s. Surveyors were assigned to the quarter sessions, the county's quarterly meeting of justices of the peace, the predecessor to the modern county council. They were given powers to requisition materials, and parishes were empowered to tax for road improvements. Moreover, labor could be hired. This mattered because hired labor has more incentive to be productive than statute labor. However, the mismatch between regional travel and local responsibility remained, and policy had not responded to technical questions, for instance, how to build roads. Radical changes began to emerge as the local quarter sessions attempted to deal with those problems. Some started charging tolls on heavy vehicles to raise money for repair. Others set maximum weight limits for vehicles. Several quarter sessions worked together to develop toll and road programs. Others wanted to increase the widths of wheels on large vehicles. Narrow wheels placed more of the wagon's load on a smaller space, creating rutting, while distributing the load across wider and more wheels increases the life of the road. In the meantime, traffic of all types continued to grow. Stagecoaches and mail wagons emerged in the early 17th century. Pack horses and mules were less and less used. Wagons increased in size and weight. The problem became acute. The Act of 1537 simply put the responsibility for bridge maintenance on the parishes, and it has few teeth in it. Technical problems had to do with the narrow width of bridges, unsuitable timber construction, and steep access and egress. The stage was set for considerable revision of highway policy. One revision allowed and encouraged turnpike developments, beginning about 1650, but taking off at about 1700. Another was a restatement of the responsibilities of the parishes. The parish's first policy emerged in the 1760s and 1770s with a rationalization tone. They attempted to define the technologies needed. 
Town access roads were to be at least six meters, 20 feet wide. The effort to control weights and vehicle configurations continued. Six horse teams hauled wagons with wheels 15 centimeters across. More horses, wider wheels. Little used routes could be abandoned. Fees were graded so that those who used the road the most paid the most. Some ills were cured, but poor construction, drainage, and bridge problems remained. Another round of road development occurred prior to the development of the railroads. The evolution of toll roads built in part from the canal experience, which is discussed in Chapter 1. The stories are intertwined. The Heart of Midlothian The center of activity in any significant Scottish burg was the toll booth. As might be expected, this is where tolls, really more akin to tariffs for entering town, were collected. But as a small, well-organized financial center, these toll booths came to be administrative centers, with courthouses and then prisons and police and fire stations. In England, similar facilities might have been called the Custom House. In Edinburgh, for instance, the Canongate toll booth dates from 1477, the present structure from 1591. Canongate was a burg just down the Royal Mile from the Edinburgh Castle, eventually incorporated into the larger city of Edinburgh. The 1737 toll booth riot, in which the mob aimed to free a prisoner jailed at the toll booth, was fictionalized in Sir Walter Scott's The Heart of Midlothian, a novel in which the toll booth was the heart. The Corvée in France The French government had been exercising considerable taxing powers in part because of the military needs of the central government. The vision and power were there, too. In the 17th century, Jean-Baptiste Colbert, Louis XIV's Minister of Finance, developed a plan for the orchestration of national life through the use of canals and roads for commercial and military purposes. A vision sometimes called Colbertism emerged. Colbertism can be summarized as the belief that the state has the wisdom, resources, and power to do the best and just things. The vision is sometimes referred to as a tradition of the Ancien Regime. Beginning in 1716, state highway engineers, the Corps de Pont et Chasseuse, prepared and standardized maps for provinces, the centralized planning of roads beginning in 1747, the year the School for Roads and Bridges was established. Between 1720 and 1770, the road construction budget increased eightfold. Plans were implemented using public capital. In addition to capacity expansion plans, standards were developed for bridges and other aspects of the physical plant. For instance, all roads were to be 18 meters wide. By 1789, the year the French Revolution began, the country had a 27,000 kilometer road network. The state engineers had maps for the entire country, and they saw the need for a plan with standardized facilities, regardless of local physical conditions and markets. A high quality state planned, financed, and operated free road system centered on Paris that had been developed prior to the emergence of the railroad. That was at a time when English major roads were toll roads improved by local capital and managed locally, and the U.S. had not much more than strips of mud. Despite its praiseworthiness as an engineering feat, the road network was burdensome to poorer farmers. Roads require resources. The king appointed tax collectors to raise money, and those who couldn't pay often saw their land confiscated. Further, from 1737, the roads were maintained by a special road tax but those who couldn't pay were required to contribute 30 days of labor per year on road crews. Farmers were inspired to overthrow the oppression of forced labor of the corvée and join the revolution. Ultimately, the revolution nationalized what private toll roads were there, as well as the king's royal roads. However, by eliminating the dedicated sources of financing and maintenance, roads became a general public service. The Begar in South Asia. Tolls were known in India and part of everyday life. Around the 11th century, one ruler, Kulatunga I, bore the name Sungandavitritan, that is, the abolisher of tolls. Elsewhere in South Asia, in Thailand, an early 13th century obelisk, whose authenticity is admittedly doubted, recalls the life during another ruler. It says in part, In the time of King Ram Kamhan, this land of Sukhothai is thriving. There is fish in the water and rice in the fields. The lord of the realm does not levy toll on his subjects for traveling the roads. What was notable in both examples was not the presence of tolls, but their absence. In India, a monthly one- or two-day corvée, during Mughal times this uncompensated contribution of human and animal labor was called bagar, was often exacted from artisans, mechanics, and sudra laborers according to surviving legal texts from very early times. The bagar was more severe in India than the corvée in Europe, 
as some persons were required to bear loads, not merely maintain roads. How early this began is unclear, but the corvée was mentioned in the Code of Hammurabi around 1700 BCE, though that document deals mostly with exemptions. The Law of Manu, around 1500 BCE, permitted the sovereign to demand temporary services. It was noted in the 7th century by Swan Sang in his travels. It was established at different times in different regions, in the 13th century in the Hoysala kingdom, and later by Muslim princes. It came and went, for example, in the Mughal dynasty, starting in the 16th century, Akbar eliminated Begar, but Jehangir reinstated it, and Shah Jahan abolished it again. It was widespread in places, especially near the Himalayan border. In some areas, for some persons, this lasted through the first part of the 20th century, and was not legally abolished until Indian independence in 1948. Despite the relatively poor quality of humans as beasts of burden, this practice was an important element of transportation, as well as construction and maintenance in India. The Corvée in Japan Gishi Wajin Den, a Chinese history from the 3rd century, provides the earliest record of Japanese roads. From this period through the Meiji Restoration in the late 19th century, roads served pedestrians and animal power transportation. As a result, maintenance was simplified and reduced, since humans and animals don't damage roads nearly as much as wheeled vehicles. The mountainous terrain was not conducive to wheeled traffic, which did not develop as it had in China and Europe. As with the islands of Greece, sea routes were more prominent than land transportation, especially for bulk cargo. Major overland routes were reported in the Chronicles of Japan Niho Shoki. After the Taika-era Reformation of 645, a central government modeled on the Chinese Tang Dynasty reorganized the governments of Japan. A system of seven kaido, or roads, was established connecting Honshu, Shikoku, and Kyushu Islands. These roads centered on Kyoto, were the Tokaido, eastern route, Tosando, Hokorikudu, San Indo, San Yodo, or western route, Nankaido, and Saikaido. The backbone provided by these roads remains, and modern superhighways in Japan use roughly the same routes that were established when they were originally constructed. The seven roads were used for domestic communication. A postal courier system, the Akiba Tenma, modeled on a system in China and similar to the later Pony Express in the United States, was established. Every 16 kilometers, stations were placed to provide roadside services and to allow riders to change horses. The corvée was imposed to construct postal stations, and a rebellion against the corvée broke out in 1764. Roadside beautification, later to be popularized by Lady Bird Johnson in the United States, was established in the mid-8th century with the planting of fruit trees along the seven roads. Road signs, or Ichirizuko, were mileposts, similar to what was constructed on Roman roads, providing navigational information for travelers, were popularized in the mid-17th century. Road standards were put in place. At the beginning of the 17th century, the Edo shogunate specified that major highways would be 11 meters wide. Secondary routes would be 5.5 meters wide. The roads were to be gravel and covered with sand. Residents who lived alongside the road through the shogunate era performed road maintenance. Walking with its overnight stays had a social side. A 1952 translation of Iku Japansha's 1800 Hizakurage provides a humorous description of travel events. During Japan's great modernization, the Meiji era, wheeled vehicles such as carts and carriages began to be used on roads. This caused roads designed for people and animals to deteriorate. Crow wrote, The Tokaido is in a dreadfully bad state, with ruts and holes large enough almost to swallow a cart, and yet traffic is very large, both in horse and manpower vehicles. The condition of roads was exacerbated as the Meiji government privileged rail and sea travel to road travel. The Fukushima incident of 1882, in which advocates of the Japanese Freedom Party were suppressed by the prefectural government, resulted from a local rebellion against the corvée labor tax imposed by the government to build roads. In response, road construction subsidies for monetary taxes were imposed. Still, it was only after World War II that Japanese roads were truly modernized. Three point four profile. John Ladden McAdam. John Ladden McAdam, 1756 to 1836, dubbed the Colossus of Rhodes, was born in Ayrshire, Scotland. As with many innovators, his interest began young. While in school, he built a model road. At the age of 14, he went to America to work for his uncle in New York City as an agent of prizes. 
a legal form of dealing in prize ships and cargoes captured by the British prior to the end of the American Revolutionary War. By the time he returned to Scotland in 1783, he was wealthy and became a road trustee for his district. Noticing the poor quality of the roads, and this being the era of the amateur scientist, McAdam, McAdam pursued a number of techniques to improve the quality of the road. He later moved to Cornwall and received a government grant to continue his work. His conclusions, documented in two books, Remarks on the Present System of Roadmaking, 1816, and Practical Essay on the Scientific Repair and Preservation of Roads, 1819, called for roads that were elevated compared with the adjacent ground and covered first with large rocks, then with smaller stones, and finally bound with gravel, all to improve drainage, which he identified as the major destroyer of roads. Following a parliamentary hearing on road building, McAdamization was adopted as the standard for construction, and McAdam was appointed Surveyor General of Metropolitan Roads in Great Britain and was compensated for his expenses in researching the issue. The technology was adopted elsewhere. McAdam's system, while more expensive than the dirt roads it largely replaced, was much cheaper than the similar quality of road inspired by Roman road building, the use of stone slabs carefully laid by masons. Richard Edgeworth improved the McAdam method by using stone dust and water, a form of cement, as a binding agent, though this was opposed by McAdam himself. In 1854, the technique was further improved in France by using bitumen, asphalt binding, to ensure a smoother surface than simply gravel and slag could provide. This tar McAdam, abbreviated tarmac, was very much the forerunner of the blacktop common today. For his efforts, McAdam was offered a knighthood, which he declined before his death. 3.5. Profile, Thomas Telford. McAdam's great rival, Thomas Telford, 1757 to 1834, was born near Western Kirk, Scotland. After spending his youth aiding his uncle as a shepherd, at the age of 14, he was apprenticed to a stonemason. In 1780, he left for Edinburgh, where he gained work as a mason, and by 1792, he was among the elite of his profession, working in London on Somerset House. As a supervisor of construction, Telford's first bridge was in Montfort across the River Severn, his other works including designing and building churches. An interesting project was a canal that was on an aqueduct across the River Dee. Rather than using clay to form the edges of the canal, which would have been too heavy, he innovated design by fixing troughs made of cast iron plates in masonry. In this era of the engineer, it was not uncommon for an engineer to work on structures, waterworks, and highways. He aided in the professionalization of civil engineering by founding the first Institute of Civil Engineers. He is perhaps most famous for a suspension bridge, such as the Menai Bridge linking the Isle of Anglesey with Wales. He also built cast iron arch bridges and turned them into works of art. In 1803, Telford was hired to help develop the Scottish Highlands. He was in charge of rebuilding the roads from London to Holyhead and from Shrewsbury to Holyhead, as well as others totaling 1,450 kilometers. He set standards for maximum grades, among others. Telford's method differed from McAdam's. First, McAdam won 25 centimeters of graded broken stone above the ground, while Telford used an 18 centimeter foundation base of larger stones, laid in a trench rather than on top of the ground. McAdam argued that Telford's method was costly and required more maintenance, and that well-drained ground would be an adequate foundation. In a sense, their dispute was the first salvo in the battle between asphalt concrete, usually called asphalt, which most resembled McAdam's method, in Portland cement concrete, PCC, which is somewhat closer to Telford, that still rages today. PCC is still more expensive and takes longer to repair, but is thought to be more durable under heavy loads than asphalt concrete. Telford is buried in Westminster Abbey. Three point six stagecoach. The evolution of transport vehicle technology is a long one, and subtle changes, tests in the modern world, were significant changes at the time. The transformation of freight travel from pack horses to horses pulling carts and wains, two-wheeled vehicles, to horses pulling wagons, four-wheeled vehicles, was not sudden, but was quite significant in improving the productivity of surface transportation. Four-wheeled vehicles were rare in England before 1500, and monopolies for use of wagons for transport between Ipswich and London were granted as early as 1582. The problem was that wagons would damage roads, creating ruts, and shake the foundations of bridges, and regulations were soon imposed, for instance in Kent in 1604. At least 91 wagoners were prosecuted for overweight vehicles in Star Chamber between 1614 and 1625. 
Other changes, such as the width of the wagon wheel, which increased in the 1700s, were in part regulated and depended on, as well on the quality and size of the road surface. Larger wheels could distribute loads more evenly, doing less damage to the road, but required a wider path on which to operate. Two-wheeled vehicles seem to have disappeared around 1623. The causes are several and include lower costs from competing technologies, wagon and pack horse, as well as disadvantages of carts themselves, difficulty of balance, difficulty in traveling downhill, difficulty in loading, danger when fording water, and smaller capacity. The carts themselves were lighter, so the amount of dead weight moved was lower. Pack horses remained and in some markets replaced wagon services. Costs of freight travel were dominated by the costs of provisioning horses, so improving horse productivity was critical. There were limits to wagon efficiencies. Though each wagon could carry more than a cart and adding horses increased the weight that could be pulled, horses suffered from diminishing marginal returns. Each additional horse had lower productivity. Still, a pack horse cost about one-third more than a wagon for a typical Oxford to London run, but on poor roads or for smaller loads, a pack horse might be more cost-effective. The innovation of the flying wagon greatly increased freight throughput. The wagon was mostly kept in motion, while wagoners and teams of horses were periodically swapped out. This reduced freight travel times, enabled an early version of what we might call just-in-time production today, and was particularly important for perishable items like some food items, though the dominant freight was in the cloth industry. Inns were places to feed horses and men and allow sleep for both but they were also loading and unloading points, and innkeepers acted as agents for the carriers. The carriers had to have warehouses at either end to store goods, and factors, agents, who would collect and distribute money and goods. Over time, the freight carriers substituted their own rest stops for inns so that they could provision their own fleet of horses and better control costs. Services were scheduled and regular and known to have occurred as early as 1737, from to London, at a speed of up to 46 miles per day, almost two miles per hour, which seems slow, but includes stopping time. The carrying trade showed great continuity, some firms lasting ne nearly two centuries. Thomas Russell and Company from the 1670s to 1841, providing service on the same route. The market lasted longer, with records of regular service dating to the middle of the 1400s in the West Country to London market. Improved roads made the stagecoach feasible in the United States for both passengers and freight traffic. Horse-powered coaches were slightly faster than walking, averaging three to five kilometers per hour, meaning the trip from New York to Philadelphia could take two to three days in the early 19th century. By 1838, over 1,000 wagons entered and left London weekly, each carrying up to six tons and pulled by six to eight horses. Ultimately, the flying wagons ended as railways took over the market. Through the 1700s and early 1800s, carriers were generally organized as partnerships, as the corporate form was not well established. This kept liability with the proprietors and made for conflicts between partners. The historical evidence remains due to the lawsuits between contending partners of Russell's. Russell's had grown to become the second largest carrier serving London around 1800. The largest was Pickford's. There's still a moving company with the name Pickford's, which traces descent from the original company founded in 1695 near Manchester. Pickford's was founded using pack horses to carry stones to help construct turnpikes and used what would otherwise be unloaded trips of horses back to the quarry to carry goods for others. They later moved into flying wagons as well as flyboats, water and animal powered canal boats, which would swap out teams to keep the goods moving. They also arranged for freight cars to be pulled by engines of the commercial railways, though that business was eventually taken over by the railways themselves. The vehicle of transportation was considered a social and economic signifier. During anti-federalist riots in Baltimore in the War of 1812, the Federalists, who were being arrested voluntarily to avoid mob justice, wanted to travel to jail in carriages befitting their station, while the mob insisted on carts. The authorities made them walk. Three point seven Turnpike Trusts. The parish roads were handled as if they were local roads serving local landowners, but the growth of mail, passenger, and freight traffic many with non-local origins and destinations, was imposing costs on the locals. Non-local and heavy local users were demanding improved facilities. The power system had problems enough dealing with strictly local demands. The toll road or turnpike was the answer. Such roads predate the canal era and early ones, for example, in the 17th century, were ad hoc extensions of the power system wherein several parishes would work out in a joint project. 
Of course, tolls were not invented in the 17th century. Precursors to tolls date to the mythological world, with Charon charging a toll to ferry people across the river Styx. It was easy enough to transfer the idea of tolls for service from ferries to bridges and then bridges to roads. Other early examples include mentions of tolls in Arabia and other parts of Asia by Aristotle and Pliny. In India, the Arthasastra identifies tolls prior to the 4th century BCE. Tolls were known among the Germanic tribes in Europe during the late Roman Empire, who offered to guide travelers through mountain passes, let's call it a protection payment, for a fee. Later tolls were widely used in the Holy Roman Empire in the 14th and 15th centuries and were thought to be interference in commerce. Returning to the early 18th century, the idea of local administrators seeking permission for tolls from Parliament met much opposition. In the large, it was regarded as attempting to foist local responsibilities onto others. The locals objected to paying tolls on roads in which they labored and which they had to use. This combination of opponents prevented many schemes from going forward. While some schemes were accepted, Parliament turned many down. When approved, there were often concessions for local traffic. Even so, there is a record of local uprisings against toll roads, riots, destruction of gates, etc. This reflected a larger conflict. Toll roads are, in a sense, the network analog of the enclosure movement facing England at the same time. Fenced fields and toll gates were redefining property relationships and class rights. Although development of turnpikes was slow in the first half of the 1700s, a pattern of development had emerged by about 1750. Town-centered sums it up. The effects on roads of traffic to London and provincial centers required action, and successful acts and schemes prior to about 1750 yielded a map of rather disconnected urban-centered routes. By then, there were 143 trusts managing about 4,800 kilometers of road. Later acts then filled in the map. By 1830, there were more than 1,000 trusts and 32,000 kilometers of road. Road trustees were local men, and they were always men of substance. Enabling acts specified powers, accounting, and meeting requirements and provided for posts of treasurers and surveyors. The early pattern was for tolls to be collected at gates by toll farmers, and after expenses were met, reinvested in repair. After experience, mortgage funding guaranteed by gate income began to be common. Toll schedules were very complex. They reflected geographical or spatial equity, the principle that those who impose costs sought to pay. The tolls thus aimed to protect roads from damage by placing high charges on excessive loads and on vehicles with narrow wheels. Levy of tolls using the Dartford to North Fleet Turnpike Road, 1760. For every coach, Berlin, Landau, Chariot, Chez, Kalash, Caravan, Hearse, Wagon, Wayne, Cart, Dray, or other carriage, drawn by six horses or other cattle, or more the sum of one shilling. If drawn by two horses or other cattle, the sum of six pence. If drawn by one horse or other beast, the sum of four pence. For every horse, mare, gelding, mule, or ass, laden or unladen, and not drawing one penny. For every drove of oxen, cows, or neat cattle, eight pence by the score, and so in proportion, for any greater or lesser number. For every drove of calves, sheep, or lambs, five pence by the score, and so in proportion, for any greater or less number. For every drove of hogs, six pence by the score, and so on in proportion. The technical view was that roads needed protecting. At the national level, the General Turnpike Act of 1773 contained 28 clauses relating to wheels, weights, etc. Thomas Telford became involved with the technology of road construction in 1803 when Parliament considered the problem of roads in the highlands of Scotland. A development scheme was initiated. Parliament would pay one half the costs if local politicians would propose schemes and pay the remaining costs. That's the first use of a financial matching scheme we know of. John Loudon McAdam obtained experience serving on trusts in the 1790s and 1800s, and he interested himself in both technology and administration. The first McAdam Road in the United States was constructed on the Burnsboro Turpike in 1823 outside of Hagerstown, Maryland. By the 1820s, much of the road system had been improved to McAdam standards. Extensive organized coach service operated at 16 kilometers per hour, there were mail wagons and mail service, and freight had emerged in two classes of service, fly wagons or vans for fast freight and heavy slow wagons, about 10 tons. Yet, the Times of London described toll collectors as men placed in a situation unfavorable to civilized manners who might be usefully employed in mending the roads which they now obstruct in a most disagreeable manner.
in an 1816 editorial, giving evidence that tolls were not held in universal acclaim. Investments in turnpikes tapered even before investment in railroads increased. After the railroads, some turnpikes failed financially and others were taken over by local government, which converted them to free roads. Others simply had their franchises expire and not be renewed. In any case, turnpikes were merged with the parish road system as the trend toward a nationally controlled and financed system of strength. Three point eight turnpike companies. At the beginning of the 1800s, road transport in the U.S. was relatively expensive. To transport a ton of good by wagon to a port city from 30 miles inland typically cost $9. For the same price, the goods could be shipped 3,000 miles across the ocean. Rural farmers could distill grain into spirits, one of the few that could justify transport by wagon. Whiskey production led to alcoholism. The means of transport profoundly affected the American diet. Road and canal development in the U.S. lagged behind that in England. Instead of being already ahead, the U.S. was rushing to catch up. Also, in contrast to France and England, the U.S. at the time was a federation of states with a weak central government. Hierarchical governments needed to learn roles. The main American turnpike experience differed from the British experience in several other ways. It began later, in the 1780s, and ended later, the onset of the 20th century. But the organizational form also differed. In the United States, private corporations held most turnpike charters, while in Britain, the turnpike trusts were institutions with more public control. The private turnpike companies were regulated, and often, especially in the early years, had some local government public investment. So we are speaking of degrees of public and private, not absolutes, when we talk about road networks. Incorporations were rare in the colonial period, but became more common as shown in 3.1. Corporation was critical for the U.S. model of turnpikes. The first authorized turnpike in the United States was from Alexandria to Berryville, Virginia, 1785, though the road was a public tax-funded road. Maryland followed in 1787. However, the 100-kilometer Lancaster Turnpike in Pennsylvania with nine toll gates, chartered in 1792, with land donated by the state was the first notable turnpike company. 69 turnpikes were chartered in the 1790s, rising to 398 by 1810. The logic behind the turnpike boom is in many ways that of an arms race, though more productive. Turnpikes increased accessibility. With a turnpike, Lancaster residents could now get to Philadelphia quickly on a broken stone and gravel road. This improved overall welfare, absolute accessibility. But perhaps more importantly, it improved Lancaster's position with respect to competing towns. It's relative accessibility who could only get to Philadelphia on slower dirt and mud trails. It was a mixed bag for Philadelphia. While it made the West more accessible, helping spark the Western migration, it brought Lancaster into Philadelphia's orbit and away from Baltimore's. Thus, it improved Philadelphia's position with respect to its rivals, Baltimore and New York. Moreover, this turnpike was profitable, paying up to 15% annual dividends to shareholders. A map of the Lancaster turnpike is shown. Over time, Lancaster positioned itself at the center of a web of radial turnpikes. In addition to the route to Philadelphia, Lancaster Columbia Turnpike, the Lancaster Marietta Turnpike, the Lancaster Millersville Turnpike, the Rockville, now Rock Hill Turnpike, the Stumptown Turnpike, now Old Philadelphia Pike. As a side note, the Lancaster Turnpike also helped birth the Conestoga wagon as a major vehicle type. Turnpikes were popular in the first two decades of the 19th century on the East Coast and Ohio. By the 1820s, the common stock in turnpikes exceeded the stock issued by banks. The corporation was still relatively new and ownership was limited, so the owners would be required to continue to invest capital in the company even after the initial purchase of shares. While the largest shares were owned by the wealthiest in the community, shares were distributed widely. Governments also picked up shares. The Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, for example, funded one-third of the turnpikes in that state. South Carolina and Indiana were bastions of state socialism in the turnpike sector. While there were turnpikes, county roads in the early 19th century U.S. were in terrible condition. As in the United Kingdom, Corvée statute labor road crews were untrained and unmotivated, farmers and farm workers working on the roads for a few days in the off-season. They might clear stumps and do some leveling, but it was all temporary. In the snow-covered north, transport by sled would be much faster than road use in the warmer months. The south favored transport by water to animal power. In general, the turnpikes were disappointing failing to reduce transport costs as much as hoped. They often did not only not pay much, if anything, in the way of dividends, they could not cover costs of collection plus operation and maintenance. 
Many turnpikes failed even before the emergence of canals and railroads. Further, shunpikes emerged, and Teamsters waited until night to pass unobserved on the toll road. Unlike toll roads, toll finance bridges were more likely to be profitable. There was greater demand and fewer alternatives. Capital sources were similar, local individuals along with governments. Some privately owned toll bridges lasted well into the 20th century. A U.S. critic in the early 1800s might have said that the central government was destined to play only limited and rather ad hoc roles in transportation development. Secretary of the Treasury Albert Gallatin's report to Congress of 1808 had recommended an extensive set of canal and road improvements. Henry Clay also wanted the federal government to fund his American system of internal improvements. Transportation infrastructure was in the early 19th century justified as fostering national grandeur and individual convenience. But no action was taken. It was claimed that the Constitution did not provide for federal activities. Was that an excuse or reason for inaction? The real obstacle to action may well have been the regional jealousies of the times. As a result, we think mainly of the problem of consensus about activities. Federal government activities were small and scattered. The Ohio Statehood Act of 1803 set aside 2%, some sources say 5%, of the proceeds of public land sales for building the Cumberland Road, the first interstate highway constructed by the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Those monies got the road built but did not provide for maintenance. An act was passed in 1822 permitting the collection of tolls for maintenance, but was vetoed by James Monroe on the grounds that the federal government lacked the necessary jurisdictional power. James Madison addressed Congress advocating establishing throughout our country the roads and canals which can be best executed under national authority, but yet vetoed the Bonus Bill of 1817 sponsored by Henry Clay and John C. Calhoun, providing federal funds for a highway linking the east and south to the west from the profits of the Second Bank of the United States as unconstitutional. Nevertheless, some federal funding for some specific roads increased from $702,000 annually under John Quincy Adams to $1.323 million under Andrew Jackson. Congressional support was weak for such improvements because of regional rivalries. New England, with relatively good roads, had little reason to support improvements in new emerging areas, such as the Midwest. Not many years later, in 1830, Andrew Jackson vetoed a bill funding the Maysville Turnpike in Kentucky on the grounds that the support of a small local project, akin to what we now call earmarking, created disharmony among the states. Opponents of the turnpikes were, in part, Easterners who objected to increasing the accessibility of the West, and thus the migration to the West, and those who opposed any federal involvement. Rival modes, canals and later railroads, also opposed government support for their competitors. Aside from the Cumberland or National Road, today's US-40, federal involvement in road building was limited. The National Road was not trivial, though, garnering $6.8 million from Congress into the 1840s and was abandoned by the federal government. While the federal government was in general out of the picture, many states participated in the private turnpike construction. Virginia, for instance, saw a network of toll roads emanating from Alexandria, sponsored by local merchants. Alexandria is just across the Potomac River from Washington, D.C. and was part of the District of Columbia from 1800 to 1846 before being retroceded back to Virginia. Local rivalries were intense. Sometimes opposition was, too, when local and town interest conflicted. Beginning in the 1840s, states started to limit public funding via stock purchases or subscriptions, having been financially burned in the Depression of the 1830s. Charters for mixed public-private corporations were becoming rarer, though municipalities in the private sector continued to cooperate to fund infrastructure without much federal or now state support. Bridges, with a stronger monopoly position due to their expense and scarcity, also sought exclusive rights. These were addressed by the United States Supreme Court in the Charles River Bridge case of 1837, which concluded that a monopoly on a river crossing granted by the state had to be narrowly construed, allowing competition which was deemed good for the public. The nature of charters was still being established as charters were considered inviolable, adding risk on the part of the state when granting a charter as it could not easily be dismissed. Three point nine plank roads. Turnpike incorporation slowed with the beginnings of the railroad in the 1830s. Aside from the plank road boom, turnpikes grew less and less important as an element of the American transportation network. By 1910, almost all turnpikes were assumed by state governments. The plank road boom, however, deserves some discussion. Wood planks provide a much smoother surface than gravel, and prior to concrete and asphalt, would enable the fastest off-rail transportation by wheeled vehicles. In the 1850s, especially in the timber-rich states, 
a boom in plank road construction took place. The greater the rank in lumber production, that is, the less lumber produced, the fewer plank, plank roads built. Similarly, the greater the population, more roads built. So construction was a function of both material supply and travel demand. The plank road boom ended as the first plank roads deteriorated. Wood planks typically last eight years in use. As the planks went bad, they either needed to be replaced, which was costly, or were abandoned, either of which would raise the cost of operation and, if passed through as tolls, the cost of travel and make plank roads much less advantageous than they had seemed eight years earlier. Three point ten mail in the gospel of speed. Neither rain nor snow nor gloom of night stays these couriers from the swift completion of their appointed rounds. Herodotus inscription on the U.S. Post Office in New York City. The U.S. Constitution made special provision for the post office and post roads. By tracking the change in communications, we can see some of the spread of transportation. The largest part of the U.S. government, the post office, was widely distributed as customers came to it to get their mail. It was not yet delivery. Alexis de Tocqueville called the post office a great link between minds that penetrated the here of the wilderness. The time of news transmission between Pittsburgh and Philadelphia dropped from 30 days to 10 days between 1790 and 1794. Similarly, from Portland to Savannah, it dropped from 40 to 27 days between 1790 and 1810. Postal officers were the largest share of federal officials and in the early 19th century, both were increasing rapidly, along with total letters and newspapers delivered. While communication speed steadily increased until the pervasiveness of the electric telegraph, speculation based on differential information was a major problem. The post office attempted to reduce this by speeding communications and prohibiting contractors who delivered the mail from the post office from delivering non-post office messages faster. The express runs from New York to New Orleans achieved 13 to 16 kilometers per hour. To further increase speed, the post office considered opening an optical telegraph network, but this was never authorized by Congress. The federal government did invest in uh, Morse's first telegraph line, but this interest was sold. The post office also served major public purposes by subsidizing the delivery of newspapers. From the days of postmaster Benjamin Franklin, the post office contracted with post riders as the primary means to distribute mail between cities. However, scheduled stagecoaches were also used, and on occasion, steamboats. Obtaining a postal delivery contract gave enough steady business to enable some stagecoach firms to proceed to offer passenger service, putting the cart before the horse, so to speak. This was particularly important in the thin markets of the South and West. Later, trains garnered a large share of this market, and then airplanes and trucks. Mail-carrying stagecoaches were much more timely than mail-free coaches, so passengers with a choice preferred to follow the mail. The U.S. Post Office began its distribution pattern as a point-to-point -point network, with each post office routing mail to each other post office. The system broke down as the volume of mail and number of post offices increased. The system was redesigned as a hub-and-spoke operation by Postmaster General Joseph Habersham in 1800, this reduced labor required and reduced the possibilities of tampering as fewer hands would touch each piece of mail. This architecture lasted until the U.S. Civil War, when continuous sorting on railway trains became more common. An important result of this change to hub and spoke is that the bottleneck was no longer link speeds, but instead sorting efficiency at nodes. The post office was the largest branch of the federal government, and its only representative in many small towns. It became a huge opportunity for patronage, since the Jackson administration, though it was more professional before and has become more professionalized since. The post office was also profitable for many years, returning funds to the U.S. Treasury in the first half of the 19th century. Under Postmaster McLean, it reinvested its profits. It also wanted to be the organization that provided a federal network of roads, for instance, proposing a 1,750-kilometer post road from Washington to New Orleans, which was never built, as Congress and later President Jackson resisted the most ambitious internal road improvements. Through the beginning of the 21st century, U.S. Postal Service is a government-owned corporation, despite some policy arguments. In other countries, the posts have been privatized and deregulated. The provision and ownership of mail services will inevitably be a policy debate as the U.S. Post Office continues to require public subsidy. The attempt to save costs by shutting post offices and reducing services has been politically contentious. Its legacy retirement and health plans will also weigh on the service. 
Nevertheless, the figure shows declining income, expenses, and mail handled in recent years and declining number of post offices since 1900. Though it is hard to see on the figure, expenses now exceed income, though the objective is for them to be equal. Three point eleven, fin de siècle. Our discussion of the decline of turnpikes contemporary with the railroads' rise may imply that regional roads disappeared as railroads were deployed. That is too simple a view. Many local roads survived very well. They served feeder functions to railroads. Local governments provided local roads, and property taxes or contribution of labor in lieu of taxes helped kept that part of the road system viable. There were increasing demands on the local road system as cities grew and as rural economic growth proceeded. With city growth, there were local markets for products of farms, and, a, and as grain, fiber, and meat production increased, specialized products were shipped from the farm via railroads to distant markets. These demands emerged in different ways in different farming communities. For example, the demands on the local road system for daily movement of fresh milk to the urban market were quite different from the demands by crops such as grain or cotton. Improving the rural local road system began as a matter of state concern during the latter part of the 19th century. The state of New Jersey, for example, passed legislation permitting counties to issue bonds for improvement of the local road system. A plausible explanation was the rapid growth of Philadelphia and New York, providing for market garden type agriculture in New Jersey. Emulation may have played a role. References were made at that time to the lot of European farmer with this somewhat better government supplied road system. The spread of bicycle technology also played a role. Growing wealthy urban areas demanded improved roads. Facility improvements like improved drainage, sidewalks, bridges, pavements, were regarded as highly desirable. 3.12, discussion. There were two styles for road planning. On the continent, and especially in France, central governments took responsibility for road development. In England, and places under English influence, road development was a local affair. As traffic between towns increased, enabling legislation was sought so that private organizations could improve roads and fund improvements from tolls. Mostly short stretches of roads were developed and the network evolved as links were improved end to end. To the extent that there were plans, they were business plans formed for the development or maintenance of an existing link. The use of wagons and coaches required facilities quite different from precursor facilities. The requirement to reduce grades often called for new route locations. Pavements and drainage were used. Bridges and inns and warehouses were constructed. Requirements for investment and maintenance placed new demands on governments and for the development of capital markets, construction technologies, and management capabilities. These developments set the stage for the subsequent creation of canal and railroad companies. Turnpikes emerged as a financing mechanism in the presence of free rider problems facing the existing road network. There were several free rides being taken. Laborers in the Corvée statute labor system were not putting in a full effort. They were shirking their taxes. Users were riding on non-local roads without compensating the locals who were responsible for them. A toll system remedied both of these problems. The remedies came at a cost, frequent stopping to pay tolls and high costs to collect tolls. Nevertheless, the system worked for almost 200 years before collapsing with the onslaught of intercity railroads, which were faster, better organized, and cheaper. Railroads avoided the free rider problem from the start. Toll roads reorganized in the United States as feeders to the railroads rather than competitors, but the long distance roads collapsed into bankruptcy. By the end of the 19th century and just before the widespread adoption of the automobile, those routes, as they had been in Britain, were taken over by local government and disturnpiked.